Hello, my name is Marko Junti. I'm professor of communications engineering here at University of Oulu. I'm also leader of Center for Wireless Communications Radio Technologies Research Unit. And at 6C Flagship, I work on different research problems related to wireless signal processing, physical layer technologies, algorithms, a little bit about transceiver architectures as well. Today, I'm going to talk about reconfigurable intelligent surfaces, which are a recent emerging technology providing wireless system performance enhancements. The topic and the title today is Reconfigurable Intelligent Surface as a Wireless System Enhancement. And this work has been done in multitude of different projects, most important of which is Ariadne, which is a EU-funded Horizon 2020 project. Then there has been significant support from Academy of Finland, including 6G Flagship, uh, some Celtic Plus projects of AI for Green, funding of which comes from Business Finland. Many of you may have heard about RIS, <coughs> these intelligent surfaces, also known as Intelligent Reflecting Surface, IRS, or Large Intelligent Surface. Many, many terms exist, and I use them mostly as synonyms. The idea is that they are low cost, low power, low complexity surfaces, which can be used to tailor the environment and the radio channel properties so that we get better performance, more favorable propagation conditions, and then we can enhance different performance metric of wireless systems, including coverage, capacity, reducing power consumption, etc., as we will discuss. They are also of interest for positioning, sensing. This is not really the topic today. Today we focus on communications metrics and, and what we know and what we have learned in our work and also in the literature, how they can be used. And the contents uh, today, uh, I'll first talk about risk channel estimation, how that impacts, how we can view it, uh, what different uh, perspectives we can take as risk being a network element or passive enhancement of the channel. Then I discuss how RIS and Relay compare, how we can make a hybrid between them. And as a final example case, I'll discuss some performance evaluations with semi-realistic simulations. And based, based on all those, I'll then conclude what we have learned and what are the current research challenges. Before going to more technical details, I will say a few words about what RIS is. I suppose that many of you have heard about that. So the idea of reflecting intelligent surface is that it's adjustable. There are some electromagnetic properties which we can adjust so that the reflection properties of the surface can be uh, adjusted and adapted based on the needs of the wireless system and the propagation conditions of the channel. And there are <clears throat> two different ideas how you can at least theoretically implement them. One is so-called continuous risk, which is based on some metasurface technologies, metasurface ideas. Or the other alternative is that you consider it a little bit like a uniform rectangular uh, antenna array <clears throat> where you have reconfigurable reflecting elements, small metal plates uh, or, or something like that. The electromagnetic properties of which you can adjust by surface current control and something like that. In this talk, we don't go to the risk implementation. Maybe we can have another 60 talk about how to implement, what are the different options, what are the practical compromises. That's a very important topic and there is work on that in 60 flagship as well. But, uh, but today we focus on the system um, performance aspects. And here is one more kind of general motivation slides. So we will use basically this kind of metal patch type idea rather than uh, or, or reflect array. We, that, that is something we discuss as well, but we don't really go to the metasurface models in this talk. What are then the use cases in communications, which is more our focus? There has been in many, but in the connectivity side, there are two main cases, so to say. One is to improve the connectivity, to modify the channel response. And that 
model applies even to sub-6 gigahertz, sub-10 gigahertz communications where we apply the classical MIMO or multi-user MIMO, massive MIMO communications. The idea is that if, for example, if your risk is close to the <coughs> access point, then you can direct the signal towards the intended area where the most users are. So kind of increasing the size of the antenna array, a little bit similar phenomenon. And the same applies at the other end. If the risk is close to the users, then you may use it as a, some sort of virtual array helping the users with possibly one or two antennas only. <clears throat> the other use case, which is of interest in the millimeter wave terahertz band, is to provide virtual line of sight. There the idea is that you can uh, avoid blockages, see around the corner by reflecting the signal from transmitter to the receiver when the line of sight is blocked. And all of these schemes can use varying levels of channel state information imposing different uh, problems and challenges to channel estimation, which is one of the core topics we discuss today. Risk channel estimation is either simple or complex, but at least it's an interesting research problem and we were uh, attracted by that uh, in the early phases when we started working on, on RIS. And as I already mentioned, there are at least two ways we can see these intelligent surfaces in the wireless communication system. <clears throat> the original starting point was that they are used to modify the channel. They are used to adjust the channel so that we can, in some sense, go beyond the Shannon theory, where we have transmitter and receiver, which we can design and optimize. And that is one view, and we, we are going to look at that. The other view, which has raised during the research, is that you can think RIS as a network element, <clears throat> which uh, has several features, more or less, and as said, we will discuss different options of that. And then it implies also that we can think the channel estimation either from transmitter to receiver, which is the classical approach in wireless communications. And if we do that, <clears throat> there are much less challenges. We can reuse the existing standards, algorithms, all that. And this is just something which is changing the channel. And we estimate it as part of uh, its impact as part of the overall channel estimation. The other approach is that we consider it as a network element, so that like a relay station, it's, it's a good uh, example, so that we need to estimate the channel from transmitter to RIS, and then separately the channel from RIS to the receiver. <clears throat> so for example, in this illustration where we show the downlink direction, we would need to estimate the channel from base station to the RIS, and then from risk to these different mobile users. <clears throat> and that, of course, poses significant challenges because the basic version of RIS is passive. It has some simple control, which controls the electromagnetic properties, the phases of the reflectors, but there is no receiver chain, so you cannot do classical channel estimation in the risk. So the research question which we faced <clears throat> and, and the community faced is that can we estimate and under what conditions we can estimate the component channels? And is there uh, any idea of doing that and try to explore that a bit? There is a recent survey, <clears throat> not by us, but it's cited here, very nicely putting this uh, into perspective. So we can think it as a separate channel estimation with semi-passive risk or semi-active risk. And that's one, one idea which we will also explore soon. Or we can think this cascaded overall channel estimation where risk is truly passive, not a network element, and we estimate everything from the transmitter to the receiver. And as shown here, we can do it either in the uplink or downlink direction. So let's explore what it takes to estimate the se channel separately so that we think RIS a little bit as a network element. We have done some work on that, and then you typically need to create some sort of geometrical channel model with transmit, receive, antenna arrays, RIS model as a reflect array, rectangular reflect array, as I explained earlier, and then we parameterize the channel, and then we need 
to make some assumptions about the structure of the channel if we wish to estimate them separately. And what we did is work towards the millimeter wave terahertz channels where we modeled both the direct channel and the cascaded component channels geometrically using the array responses. And then we made the assumption that the channels are somehow sparse. And if that's the case, then we can estimate the finite number of parameters, which would include the propagation delay, uh, directions of arrival and departure of the incoming waveforms. And uh, then, based on those, we can even determine the position of the mobile user if we know where the base station and the risk are. So we are creating a virtual anchor. So that's something we, we have have done and <clears throat> that's a way to solve a problem. There are a few others and I summarize some of them here in the literature. So one can autoconalize uh, the transmissions so that <clears throat> you switch on off uh, some of the risk elements on off meaning that you switch the surface current so that they become observers rather than reflectors. That of course requires a lot of training overhead because you know, you need to go through all the risk elements and risks easily are quite large with lots of elements. The other approach which we did is to utilize the channel sparsity so that you can use compressive sensing, sparse recovery <clears throat> algorithms. Other approaches are different data-driven machine learning approaches, which usually require some sparsity too, or capitalizing the multi-user setup and noting that the the risk based station channel is usually the same for all users. And <clears throat> then the final approach is that we use actually some active received chains in the risk, which is practically appealing, but that's then clearly taking us to the thinking that risk is a network element, not fully passive, entitled to modify the channel. Few words about different approaches. So our compressive sensing work, which we have published, you can see the citation there, <clears throat> is that we do multi-stage ray training. We need to use different uh, transmit beams, and then we need to adjust different uh, uh, phase shifts also in the risk. So the training overhead in general becomes quite large. And then, but anyways, if you do it, what we can do is that using structure and the sum of the channel and knowing the number of significant parts in the channel and assuming that that's relatively small, which is fine as an assumption in the higher millimeter weight terahertz bands. And then we can use different sparse recovery algorithms uh, to recover the channel uh, parameters. And we use atomic norm minimization, but there are many others. You can use orthogonal matching pursuit and so on. Any sparse recovery can be probably adjusted for this purpose. Atomic norm minimization has the benefit that <clears throat> you can automatically adjust the grid of your quantization, which is beneficial, and that's why we ended up, up using it. And our results show that we can estimate the channel with these assumptions. The training overhead remains uh, large, but, but we can improve the performance of the, let's say, somehow benchmark orthogonal matching pursuit, which is one of the very basic uh, sparse recovery algorithms. But the complexity is still significant and the training overhead is large. And that's why we look different schemes, how we can reduce the complexity and possibly improve the performance. One approach was that if we know roughly the locations of the users with some error tolerance, and thereby we know roughly the angles out of which the signal should uh, be departing from the risk in the downlink or by which they are arriving in the uplink. And that work is also cited there. And with that, we can reduce the training overhead and improve the performance, both the MSC and the effective spectral efficiency. And that is truly helpful. So that's, in my opinion, showing that we should consider this channel estimation and positioning together in, in practical designs. 
In the literature, very briefly, there are a few other approaches. One is so-called decomposition, <coughs> AD channel estimation, <coughs> which doesn't require so much necessarily the sparsity. Of course, it simplifies if the channel is sparse. Uh, it's very nice scheme, provides good performance, but the training overhead is still quite large. It's nice work from Hansos group. Then you can also, as mentioned, utilize the multi-user functionalities so that <clears throat> you alternate how you train the channel estimator from different users and thereby you can get benefits on the system level. But all of these <clears throat> are still quite complex in terms of training overhead. So one important trend in the current literature and research is that you actually make the risk semi-active or only semi-passive so that we have received chains in the risk. So it takes a step towards the network element. And that of course simplifies the channel estimation because we can estimate the component channels separately. We have also done a paper on that where we combined, uh, let's say, very relatively large risks, very few uh, received chains, and we still use the atomic norm minimization so that we don't need too many received chains. It improves the performance as we can see here and reduces somewhat the, the training overhead as well, but still with this approach, it's somehow complex. If you can allow more receive chains in the risk, then of course you can reduce the training overhead and at least reduce the complexity. So if I summarize <clears throat> what I think we have learned so far is that the separate channel estimation with uh, passive risk is possible. But if you have semi-active, semi-passive risk with few received chains, it becomes much more simplified. Then if you don't try to estimate the separate channel components, everything remains much simpler. And still you can get reasonable performance as we will see in the forthcoming parts of the talk. So I would say that this truly passive risk implies that there is too much complexity and overhead to estimate the component channels. So if you want to use them, you need to make RIS a network element. That's my cut on this. If you want to make RIS as a network element, then few further questions raise. For example, how does it compare to the performance of a relay station? And are there some nice ways to make a compromise between relay and RIS because they have some similarities if you start to make RIS as an active element. So <clears throat> one starting point is that there have been works which show that the RIS needs to be quite large to get good performance gains. And <clears throat> that can be a practical problem for the size of the risk, for the implementation, for the control. It can be a problem for the channel estimation if we want to do it for the composite channels and so on. And therefore, we were curious to see that if we would make a compromise between risk and relay station so that we would make risk as active in the sense that few of the elements are actually Active, we'd have an active amplifier, power amplifier, so that you could use also amplitude control. Not in all of them, because then it would be just a regular relay, but in small portion of them. And that's what the scheme we called as hybrid of the relay, or hybrid relay reflecting intelligent surface, HRRIS. And in addition to possibly being nice practical compromise. It also is a nice way to analyze and characterize the performance trade-offs between <coughs> RIS and Relay. And, and you can see here the reference of the work where more details can be find, found. So <coughs> the basic idea is, is something as we saw here. So we have the RIS and then some of the elements, those which are red, it could be active so that there is an amplifier connected to them. A reflect amplifier could be a practical implementation. <clears throat> and then we model that, that it would act as a amplify and forward relay for that 
particular element. And we assume that we can control the phase shift and the amplitude of that element. And for the rest of the elements, we can control only the phases. And that means that <clears throat> our phase control matrix, which is common way to model RIS response in the system level and signal processing studies, has two components. Some of the components are active so that you can control both the phase shift and the amplitude. And then the rest are as in regular risk that you can only control the phases. So these are unit norm complex coefficients. And then we have considered two different ways of modeling it. One being a fixed hybrid risk, meaning that the elements where the amplitude control is possible, they are fixed, for example, the corner of the risk, uh, or you can actively select which of the elements you can control the amplitude. Of course, the fixed one is probably much easier to implement, but the dynamic one gives you performance gains, as, as we will see. So <clears throat> we have analyzed the downlink sum rate optimization. And there our model is that we have the reflected signal. Then we have the relayed signal. Reflected comes from the passive elements. Relayed comes from the elements which have also the amplitude control. And then we can have also some noise amplification in the active elements, like a relay station. And then we have the received noise. So that's the received signal model which we have here. And here we assume that the channels are perfectly known. So we assume that we have had the solubate to so know, know and estimate the channels in the ways we described, for example, in the previous part of the talk. <clears throat> and then we receive our signal, we model <clears throat> the signals as Gaussian and do some sort of classical rate optimization. So we wish to maximize the spectral efficiency subject to the power constraints in the active elements and also, of course, in the transmitter itself. We devise an alternating optimization algorithm and then we can solve the problem and <clears throat> evaluate the spectral efficiency as a function of the transmit power. And as we can see from here, there are significant gains by allowing the amplitude control compared <clears throat> to the pure risk only. Of course, the gain, as we can see here, depends on how large is the power budget in our active relay elements. So here we have the transmit power from the base station. Here we have different levels of power consumption in the relay elements. And this is the passive risk, assuming perfect channel state information. And then we have as a performance also risk with totally random phases. So it's not actually just a reflecting surface in some sense, not truly really intelligent yet, or, or we don't have the proper channel state information. And in this case, we assume that the risk is closer to the mobile station than the base station. So it's the idea is that it is sort of semi-virtual array supporting the mobile reception. And then we have compared also the impact of the number of active elements. So, so at some point, <clears throat> the performance gain start to saturate again, depending on your power budget. So if your available power is very small compared to the uh, overall transmit power, then you don't gain that much of the active risk compared to the pass passive one. But then with the larger power budget, the more active elements you can have. So the number of active elements here runs from one to 20 when the overall number of elements in the risk is 50. So significant portion. So of course, <clears throat> I think the practical region would be somewhere here in the lower end, and there you can already get quite good gains. Then we have extended this use case to different contexts and cases. We have analyzed a cell-free massive MIMO system assisted by hybrid relay risk so that we have 
a network <coughs> with access points connected to central processing unit. And then we have hybrid relay risk stations at the sort of uh, not cell edges because this is cell free, but close to the areas which are sort of far away from the access point so that they can again support the reception in the mobile or in the uplink direction support the coverage in the uplink transmission case. So both cases have been considered in, in this work, which is available as early access in IEEE trans wireless communications. And in this work, we also modeled the channel estimation in a kind of simple manner. We calculated the channel estimation overhead with the approach which is commonly used in the massive MIMO or cell-free MIMO literature. And then we evaluated the sum rate performance and analyzed it, <clears throat> found quite accurate analytical characterization of the performance. And here we can see simulation results where the red curve is showing the performance with 10 hybrid risks, blue one with five of them, and then also we compare that to <clears throat> conventional receives which are passive. And as you can see in the system level, the average throughput versus the maximum transmit power, it's getting quite good gains. So of course, all that depends on the channel modeling and propagation losses, but we try to make them quite realistic as well. So it seems that also there are good possibilities for system level performance gains. So, summary of this idea is that if we really take serious steps towards the risk being a network element, so that you have received chains, we didn't really model them in this work, but that's maybe the implicit assumption so that you, you can do efficient channel estimation, which is beneficial. You can take one step further and make them a little bit like relay stations with few reflect amplifiers. And if you do that, you get quite good gains. I didn't show now the detailed comparison of fixed and dynamic. Even with the fixed trees, you get good gains. But the dynamic one, which was assumed in most of the results I showed, <clears throat> the gains are even larger. And the reason is that you can get a regain because the risk becomes from, you can think it similarly as the transition from like 20 years ago from phased arrays to MIMO transmission, where you had also the amplitude control in addition to the phase control in the antenna arrays. It's a similar idea, a similar gains here. And you can get these gains in cell-free massive MIMO. We have also work where we analyze it in the UAV context so that we have uh, uh, RISCs or hybrid relay RISCs in the ground to support the UAV connectivity and the gains work quite nice there as well. And I think that's an uh, interesting tool for positioning and channel estimation using these as additional virtual anchors that we didn't do yet, but that's, that's something we see as quite important and interesting area of future work. As a final part of my presentation today, we are discussing some system performance examples with varying levels of system modeling accuracy. So we consider 5G, new radio, standard compatibility of some of the schemes. And then as an other item, we consider realistic ray tracing based channel emulation and its integration to RIS in few selected physical environments. So as we have seen, the composite channel estimation is challenging. And there is the other way that we don't try to do it. We control the risk phases just based on the directions, if we know them at least to some level of accuracy. And if we don't, <clears throat> then we can also do the <clears throat> just a relatively simple or simpler at least search of the risk phases to maximize the received power at the receiver, whether it's uplink or downlink transmission. And in this part, first we consider such receipt power or more precisely signal to noise ratio configuration of the risk phases to perform coverage extension 
in 5G new radio systems operating in the 3.5 gigahertz band <clears throat> below 6 gigahertz anyways. So uh, in that area, <clears throat> the direct channels between the transmitter receiver, base station mobile is seldom fully blocked. So that's different to the millimeter wave band where the important use case for the risk is that we, so to say, see around the corner or avoid the blockage caused by different obstacles. In these lower bands, the direct channel may be blocked, but still the non-line of sight components are quite significant, as we know from the earlier MIMO works. That's how, how MIMO works in general. And here we assume that there is the direct connection, and then we have a RIS as an, let's say, enhancer. And in particular, here we are interested in the case that RIS is relatively close to the user equipment, with the idea that we use it to enhance the coverage close to the cell edge. And as said earlier, it means that the RIS is in some sense fully in, in the independent virtual array supporting the UE transmission in the uplink. And here we <clears throat> use passive RIS in the sense that there are no amplifiers. It's the classical RIS with uh, just phase control. We assume that we know the locations of the base station and RIS so that we can adjust the phases so that the angle of the departure of the signals from the RIS towards the base station can be controlled well. UE position is not known, so we need to learn the RIS phases to control the phases of the RIS so that the signal transmitted from the user to the base station has a good quality and high SNR. And then the channel estimation is the good old one. We estimate just the combined channel, <coughs> including the direct component, and then the overall response from the user via RIS to the base station. And we use 5G new radio channels, and we are particularly interested in the physical uplink shared channels, so because that's one of the core bottlenecks to determining the coverage of the <clears throat> system. And we model the channels as non-line of sight channels between the user equipment and base station. And then our assumption is that we position the risk in some sense well, that it is able to provide the virtual line of sight connection via the risk element. So we assume that it's one tap line of sight channel between the user and the risk and risk and base station. And here are a few results. We can see that we can have increases in the normalized throughput compared to the no risk case. <clears throat> and the key thing which we actually evaluate there are the different levels of pointing errors. So if we make error in the optimum, we calculate the optimum angles, the optimum phase shifts, assuming that we know the directions perfectly. And then, as mentioned, our assumption is that we don't know that. And then here we evaluate how big is the impact with different levels of pointing errors. And as we can see here, the pointing errors cause <clears throat> declarations in the performance, depending on the size of the risk. The larger the risk, the more accurate pointing is required to get the best possible coverage enhancement, the best possible SNR. But then on the other hand, of course, the absolute numbers are different here. So as you can see <clears throat> with this larger risk of 16 times 16 size, the area is pretty large. And even with the large pointing error, it can be larger and is larger typically than with the smaller risk. So everything is relative and you should in that sense be careful when interpreting the results. But the larger the risk, the more array gain we can have. Okay, it's not array gain, but direction gain, even with the passive risk, but then <clears throat> the more sensitive it is to the pointing errors. So we may require more training <clears throat> and to get the angles correctly. Here is also an indication <clears throat> how the precoder index in the 5G new radio precoder selection is affected. Then <clears throat> the other 
study which I mentioned is to evaluate the performance with realistic uh, ray tracing based channel emulation. And you can see from our recent papers <coughs> more detailed description of the uh, emulator itself. But it's based on ray launching and rather accurate modeling of the reflections and other key you know, in the radio channels affecting the propagation. And the RISIs are modeled again as a uniform rectangular arrays. And we do here also the direction based RIS steering so that we have, for example, in this study, we have different <coughs> transmitter locations. RIS is positioned here, and then we have different receive locations. And <coughs> when we evaluate, the field strengths with different radio receiver positions <clears throat> and different transmitter positions. Okay, this is a busy slide with a lot of figures, not going through all of them, but we can make some conclusions with, with these rather extensive simulations. Uh, first of all, for most cases, risk channels are better, so they give us gain as we hoped. But there are a few cases when this is not exactly the case. And then there are a few cases where risk can even, for some reason, degrade the performance. But in general, the message is that quite often, but depending on the location, we get gains. And if you do things well, risk should not actually degrade your performance. And Steering errors, their impact was studied here as well, and the realistic modeling of the channels shows that they are quite significant. So if you have steering errors, they degrade the performance kind of quickly. Here is another example where we have transmitter here. These are buildings. And this is the area where we place the receivers and measure the field strength from the simulations. So there is no line of sight in the transmission without RIS. And with RIS, we can create a virtual line of sight in this area, but not here. And here we see the field strength without RIS and with RIS. And as expected, in this area where we get the virtual line of sight, the performance and the field strength, the signal quality is improved, while here where the risk, so to say, doesn't see that's not the case. So it's just confirming that it happens also with realistic channel modeling as we would expect. And here is one more example where we compare the field strength performance with different frequencies, 30 gigahertz and 140 gigahertz, so the lower millimeter wave, upper millimeter wave. RIS has here 30 times 30 elements and the batch size is in the design lambda half. So it implies, of course, that the risk size in different frequencies is different. And that will have interesting implications to the performance, as we will see soon. So here we have the parts or the field strength, again, without risk in the lower millimeter wave band, 30 gigahertz frequencies. And when we place a RIS here, <clears throat> here we see the field gains and this is now the difference. This is showing the performance gains. So again, the transmitter is here and the set the receiver varies in all this area. So if the risk is here, this is the region where we get gains in the performance as one would expect. And the gains are in some sense significant. So I think that it's useful, useful performance enhancement. And then we consider also the case of two risks. If we have two reflections, then the gains, of course, get smaller because with these two reflections, we have already a lot of attenuation in the propagation, but it's still, it's a way to improve a little bit the signal quality back here. So even a two bounce reflection gives you some gain. The same case with 140 gigahertz. Uh, and here we can see that the gains are smaller than we hoped. 
the reason is that because we keep this size of the risk the same in the number of elements and the element spacing is half of the wavelength, the physical size of the risk is a bit too small. It doesn't collect enough power from the transmitted signal. So when we actually de increase the size of the element so that the physical size of the risk increases so that now we have two times the wavelength the element size the gains get larger also the two bounce gains get larger the steerability diminishes that we didn't uh, show how it impacts of course that has a drawback so but i think the message we get here is that in the realistic uh, channels with realistic channel emulation you need also to think the physical size of the risk to have enough power which you can steer by that. And <clears throat> what we learned from here is that even with no composite channel estimation, with using RISCs just based on the directivity, <clears throat> you can get good gains. The beam accuracy is important to varying degrees depending how you do the steering. And it also tells us that the realistic modeling of the channels <clears throat> still give, gives the same message. This is useful, but you need to design the overall control and the system appropriately. Okay, so now we are coming to conclusions, discussion of my presentation. So this is interesting. And as we have seen in the discussion and results, there are several challenges related to channel estimation, the control of the risks, the performance evaluation. And we have now looked at uh, different aspects of those, how to do the channel estimation. And I think the message we learned from there is that either we do it as without risk, so that we just estimate the overall composite channel, not the component ones, or we take risk as a network element so that it's somehow semi-passive, semi-active with received change to enhance the channel estimation. And if we go to that direction, it may be of interest to make it towards the relay station, at least in some applications, so that you have also active amplifiers there. And then <clears throat> with these modifications, I think that RISIS would be quite interesting for integrated sensing and communications and do positioning assisted with them. And as mentioned, those are among the core research challenges we should work in the future. Another one which I didn't talk about is related to the white band effects when you have beam squint. Here we illustrate beam squint in the transmitter receiver chain with no risk. But if the risk is large enough, if the bandwidth is, is large enough, the risk response on different subcarriers or different parts of your transmit band will be become frequency selective. It will depend on the frequency. And that is something on which there are very few works. There is one citation given here, but I think that's one important aspect to look in the future. Others include, of course, practical implementation and the losses in the system performance given those and, and many others. I think this is still a very exciting and important field of research. Thank you for your attention. It was a great pleasure to talk to you about intelligent surfaces. Looking forward to discuss with many of you. Please feel free to contact me, other our researchers, if you are interested in the topic and working with us.